Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to continue reading A.T. Jones. But before we do, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have in studying your word, especially on the Sabbath and the fellowship that we can have. We invite your presence into our hearts, into our group, into our discussion, into our thoughts. We know, Lord, that um, when we look at ourselves, we see that we fall short, and we just ask, Lord, that we can look to your righteousness and recognize that all righteousness comes from you and that you want to uh, clothe us with your righteousness, that we can reflect your character. And we pray, Lord, that um, these truths can be well understood by each person who takes the time to study and pray and to follow the light that you have given. Be with us now in this study. Be with those that are struggling in various ways. May your angels watch over them. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so b before we began the study, I asked some people if we're going too slow and people are happy with the pace that we're going through reading A.T. Jones. Of course, we know um, we're about a third of the way through his his um, 1890, well, it's, this would be his general conference uh, messages that he gave from 1893 to 1903. Now, so it's going to take us a while to get through all of these. Whether we're going to read every single one, I'm not, I don't think we will. We'll probably do the 1895. And, um, and I might take a few sermons here and there. But I, I did feel it was important to go through the 1893 step by step. Uh, Jones builds up uh, a picture that, that um, you know, builds it up bit by bit, and you start to see the picture forming. If you just skim through his material or read an article here or there, um, you wouldn't have an understanding of what he's trying to say. Now, we, of course, know spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and it's been through um, the Holy Spirit that God has been teaching us and helping us to understand the things that we've been reading. And we can see how somebody who does not have the spirit of Christ or is not interested in the truth can take Jones' words and misconstrue them. And, and this is something that I've seen through the years um, on both sides of the uh, religious political spectrum. I mean, from liberals to conservatives um, you know, I gave an example, one not in this series of studies, but another time when Ron Spear, when I, I ran into him and, and uh, at Silver Hills, he was, happened to be there when I was there. And um, he, you know, I got a, a good chance to talk with him. What, what's happening here? Well, it looks my my screen locked up. So I have to reboot this other computer. Just hang on a sec. So I was telling you about uh, Ron Spear. And um, so I was sharing with him um, what I'd found in my study of, of Jones and Wagner. I shared uh, some statements of Jones from the, um, it would be the uh, consecrated way to Christian perfection. And I shared with him some Wagner statements from um, the two books on Galatians. And Ron Spear told me out and out that I was teaching heresy. So he, he wasn't impressed with Jones and Wagner. Yet, uh, he was a person who uh, believed in Jones and Wagner, at least gave them lip service. But these weren't, uh, you know, sort of little arguments of Jones and Wagner. These were the basis of 
their whole understanding of righteousness by faith, which had to do with the nature of Christ. And uh, so he, you know, Ron Spear obviously didn't agree with my understanding of that, but he just didn't even agree with the statements. He didn't agree with the idea that Christ um, felt the guilt of sin his whole lifetime. He thought that that was original sin. And um, so this was something that, uh, you know, many people, so a conservative would look at this and say, well, he's Jones isn't using the right terminology. I think he's, he's wrong there. And then we also saw this with um, liberals as well, taking Jones' words and, and making him to some kind of legalist, however they wanted to see it. Um, so, so this is, is an issue that we have with um, people who are not, and I'm not making a judgment about Ron Spear, but they're just not open to understanding certain things. So I have to read this, this computer here. Sorry about that. So, um, so, so what Jones has done so far, so I'm going to have to, without looking at, at that. So what he's done so far is he's, he says that where, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. And so we know that that parallels our history and uh, that they're in the loud cry. And that this, that time basically is short. And his message is endorsed by Ellen White. So Ellen White, she isn't there at the 1893 General Conference, but she obviously gets to read the sermons that were presented, and she believes that this is truth. And remember, we read uh, uh, a letter that she wrote to, can't think of the guy's name, but she wrote to, and this person was at the 1893 General Conference and had come back to Australia and was teaching uh, a separation um, from the church. So teaching basically that the church is Babylon. And um, so she had to uh, address that and said that this person really needed, had not heeded the, the message of A.T. Jones and others at uh, the conference and that he needed to be converted. So this was something um, that was interesting that we had a counterfeit message being presented based upon um, what, what had happened at the Chicago World's Fair and, and a misinterpretation of the scripture. And, and we ended up looking at that because I, I think Dwight had sent me that, um, that uh, statement, if I remember correctly. Um, just because it, it had mentioned, um, what was the key words in that, Dwight? Do you remember? I'm trying to remember right now. Um, I think it's just dealing with the Chicago World's Fair. Yeah, that, that was one that I think Stephen and I both had sent to you. Okay. Could be, could be. Um, but it was pretty interesting. I mean, uh, you know, and how he goes through it. I mean, it, it's really paralleling what had been happening in the movement regarding right. the prediction of Trump and so forth. So taking information um, and then uh, taking that information and misapplying it. Uh, so, so it was rather interesting in that sense. For some reason, this isn't starting up. Sorry, I have to wait for this. Once in a while, this uh, old computer locks up, and it just there's nothing I can do about it other than reboot it. So, so then Jones is is going to lay out why we can't be activists, why we're not going to be political. He lays out the fact that um, we we can't compete with the powers of the world. You know, we can't enter onto their ground. He doesn't say it that way. But if we try to beat the world on their ground, and that to me would be like somebody who's a prepper or, you know, somebody who's getting involved in politics, trying to stop the Sunday law or stop the oppression or stand up for our rights. They that take up the sword will perish by the sword. 
And so we have to align ourselves with the power of God, which is the only thing that can overcome the world. And then from there, he draws us into um, the understanding of the third angel's message. So he gives us this, um, um, you know, that we know that it's connected to the Sunday law, right? It's warning about the Sunday law. But he shows how it's it's really the righteousness of Christ because we can't we can't understand God's ideas. God, you know, God is greater than us, and so we have to submit to His ideas. And um, and then He's going to directly bring us into this um, understanding what this experience is, what kind of experience. Christ had, but also how this relates to the first, second, and third angel's messages. So Jones understands on some level that there is a repeat, that there is a repeat, that there's 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 a repeat. Well, it's like you're in a cave. Yeah, well, that's just because the other speaker's on. Uh, it's kind of odd that it it happened on the word there is a repeat because there was. <laughs> um, and what this reminds me of is we just did a calculation before this meeting started where we had a repeat. That is, we would take uh, um, the number of days from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month in 2030. And we subtracted that by 354 for the number of days in the year in 457 BC. And we got um, 191 days, 20 hours. And this decimal that is a repeat of 44 minutes, 44 seconds. And every time you divide it, you subtract out the 44, you get the same decimal and it just keeps repeating the same calculation over and over. So, um, so maybe there's some providence there in, uh, how uh, that has happened. But anyway, um, so this, um, this repetition of history uh, that we have um, in, in Jones history in 1893, um, and that, that really is a result of 1888. And, and we, haven't, we haven't actually spent the time to really put that on a line uh, to understand this and, and maybe we should at some point um though this study isn't particularly about the lines per se i mean we're focusing upon this history of 1888 but uh the connection there between 1893 and um and 9 11 so we're going to have this mighty angel of revelation 18 come down and we know of course that's we're in the history of the sunday law so Jones thinks he's in the history of the Sunday law. And the question is, was he? Was he in the history of the Sunday law? If I understand the question correctly, I would think yes. Yeah, so so he's in the history of the Sunday Law. Because of the Blair Bill. I was thinking of the Blair Bill. Yeah, because he well he's got the Blair Bill in 1888, and and then he has uh, um, the, the the Chicago World's Fair in 1992 or 1892. Pardon me. So so Jones is in the history of the Sunday Law, but that history is typical, right? I mean, it's not the actual Sunday law. The Sunday law didn't come about. But, but Jones sees that the Constitution had been compromised. And so he says, you know, there's no more time for protests or signing petitions. Um, right? open this file just hang on sorry about that so so we can see that the political aspects that have been a part of this movement um 
have to be set aside. That is, even though we have these feelings about what's happening in the world, you know, uh, for Canadians, we hate Trudeau. Um, that is not our mission, right? That's not our message. Right, so so this this is something that sometimes can be a little bit difficult to take because we would like to we'd like to stop the evil that's happening. And how do we stop the evil that's happening as Christians? How do we do that? Can we stop the evil by, yeah, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, right? You know, definitely we're not going to be able to beat the world, right? We're not going to be able to defeat them. Um, so it's the gospel. And, and I knew this even before I was an Adventist, um, even really before my conversion. Um I understood the idea that, you know, he who takes up the sword will perish by the sword. So I was a pacifist as a child. Doesn't mean I didn't get into fights. But, um, but you know, I believe that the power of, of love was going to be the only that you couldn't fight fire with fire, so to speak. And then, of course, as I became uh, a Christian and then an Adventist, I understood this principle much deeper in that you're not going to change the world through politics. And, you know, my dad was very political um, and I wasn't, I wasn't interested in politics at all, especially once I became converted because I recognized that, that nothing was going to be accomplished. You weren't going to defeat the tide of evil and that we had to work on a battleground that was, in the realm of the individual, first in ourselves, and then those around us. And that's the only battles that, that we can fight to sort of take on the whole world um, is, is, is not the mission that God has given us. He's, we, we are to work, work with him, cooperate with him in spreading the gospel. So, so what what Jones has done is he's compared the true gospel and the false gospel. And he's shown clearly that we trust in Christ's righteousness, and yet Christ's righteousness will be manifest in our lives, not so that we can see it, because we're not going to see ourselves as righteous if we're focused upon Christ's righteousness. So we don't even know really what righteousness is. You know, if we can't really conceive of it, um, how could we then possibly uh, produce it? in and of ourselves, because righteousness, in a sense, is, is something that's infinite, and we are finite. Okay, so we're going to go on and read. Now, he's here talking about the outpouring of the latter rain, so that we had read uh, this about what he had, talking about Brother Prescott, what he had, had done. So he says, uh, this takes up the subject exactly where Brother Prescott stopped. Uh, do you see it is Christ in us, that living presence that does the righteous work, and that is by the Holy Spirit. That is what the Holy Spirit brings. That is the outpouring of the latter rain, is it not? You see, we cannot study anything else. That is the message for us now. Shall we receive the message? When we receive the message, what do we receive? Congregation of Christ. And when we receive him, what have we? Uh, a voice says, the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. And Joan says, this will come more fully afterward. Now, another thing, brethren, I do not want you to put off until after the meeting you're receiving of it. You do not need to do that at all. What the Lord wants is for you and me to come here each evening, and sit down and receive that just exactly as he gives it, just exactly as he says it. You just open your mind and heart to the Lord and say, Lord, that is so. Now, uh, he brings up an interesting point here. Because often when we look at 
the latter rain and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We usually see it as a singular event. and We, we compare it to Acts chapter 2. But did the disciples have to continue receiving the Holy Spirit each day? Didn't they just get it all poured out all at once? And then from now on, they've had the Holy Spirit. They don't need to seek it each day. It's a, it's a process. It's a process. So they're going to need it each day, aren't they? <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Because the Holy Spirit, the message of the latter rain, is light. Um, they're still continuing to study, to learn, and to grow. They don't know all things. They understand their dependency upon Christ and, and light comes through them because of their constant connection with Christ. But we often sort of think of it as, you know, we get the Holy Spirit, the latter rings poured out, and you know, now we we are equipped to give a message. But we we have to start this process now. That is, the Holy Spirit can be given to us today, but it needs to be given to us tomorrow. And God's been giving this movement. A great deal of light which is through the holy spirit so um so this idea of you know just this magical thing that happens and all of a sudden we're not we're no longer we're sinning and we're all powerful i mean that just starts now by submission to god and we don't even realize what god is doing how he's using us uh, because in a sense, he's using us in spite of ourselves. We are submitted to him, but we don't really understand his working. So <clears throat> now another thing, brethren, I do not want you to be put off until after the meeting you're receiving of it. So you're not going to wait till after the meeting to receive it. You do not need to do that at all. What the Lord wants is for you and me to come here. Each evening, each time we study together, each time we study on our own, we're looking to receive the Holy Spirit, receive whatever it is that God wants to give us, right? So we open up our mind and heart to the Lord and say, Lord, is that, is it, that is so. And the congregation says, Amen. Don't wait until you go out of the house. Well, says one, are we to sit down here and take everything that is said without question at all? No, not in that sense. But we are to sit down here and have such a measure of the Spirit of God that we can see what he gives through that word, which is the truth, and then take it because it is the truth. The congregation says, Amen. Now, Elder D.C. Babcock says, Brother Jones, please read Job 29-23. Elder Jones, very good. <clears throat> and they waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide, as for the latter rain. All right, what shall we do? What does the Lord want us to do? Wait for his spirit as for the rain. Open your mind. Wait as for the latter rain. What did he say by David? Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. Brethren, let us sit down here and open our mouths just like little birds. You know how they do. It looks as though the mouth was all the bird there, there was. That is what he wants us to do. Can we not trust God to give to us what he wants us to have? Brethren, there is a question in that that I want to ask. When we come into a place like this, come with hundreds of people who are seeking the Lord, come asking the way to Zion with our faces thitherward, do we need to sit here suspiciously looking cross eyes at the Lord as though we did not dare to trust him for what he would give? Is that honest? Congregation, no. Is that fair? Congregation says, no. No, sir. I believe this much in the Lord, that when we come together with our hearts seeking him, every one that lays his heart wide open to receive what the Lord has to give will not receive anything but what God gives. And the man who comes into such a place as this, with his suspicions, suspicions aroused, and with a readiness to look askance at the Lord. That man is not treating the Lord as a person ought to treat the Lord. He's treating the Lord just as a person might 
fairly treat the devil, is he not? Now, we can relate this back to what God has been giving this movement. Has there been a criticism of light in this movement over the last, you know, four or five years? Maybe even longer. But have we seen light coming to this movement and people thinking that it's a righteous thing to question and criticize? Yeah. Yep. Say so. And I know Jeff experienced this a lot in the movement. People would say, well, you know, God's moving on from Jeff now. Now he's moving on to me or to this idea. And Jeff doesn't understand that idea. Right. So Jeff was having all these attacks upon him giving this message. And and the attacks were upon him for the most part. People didn't spend the time studying together. They just had some ideas. All the taxes on the message itself. Yeah. And and so we, we, we have the same, right. and especially with all this, this information, chronological information, the chronology, uh, the structure of prophetic chronology, there's all kinds of criticisms going around instead of people just studying it out. And, and recognizing that God was leading this movement. And then when things didn't turn out the way that people expected, they said, well, God wasn't leading the movement. And, and once you do that, you say that God wasn't leading the movement, well, everything becomes undone. I mean, the whole, the whole thing unravels from that point of view. You're going to see error all the way back because God was leading us he was giving us light, and then you deny the light behind you. What's going to happen? Go into darkness, probably. You're, you're going to uh, go into darkness and fall into, you're going to go off the path and fall into the dark, wicked world below. That's what happens when we reject light. So we must be able to recognize whether it is light or not. God gives us that ability. Right? Because that ability is not something that we could have in and of ourselves. God must give us that ability. As we submit to him, he can give us the ability to know what is truth and what is error. I remember when I was uh, first an Adventist, so I must have been an Adventist maybe a year and a half or so. And I can't remember which book it was. I don't, I don't know if it was... Um, Adventism for a new generation. I don't think it was. I think that was a book that came later, but it was kind of a similar book to that. Um, it, it professed to be teaching the truth. And when I, when I picked up the book, uh, God told me to pray. And, and so I prayed to God, if this book is true, you know, I need to know it. If it's error, I need to know that. And, um, so when I read it, God would point out to me the error in the book. And it wasn't my own mind because I was open up to whatever was true. It didn't come with preconceived ideas. I didn't know a lot. Um, I definitely didn't think I knew a lot. I knew how little I knew. And so I needed God to show me what was true and truth and what was error. And a lot of the things that he taught me, because I hadn't read the book Desire of Ages yet at that point, uh, when I read the Desire of Ages, some of the statements that I had come up with um, uh, to express what I had learned, I found that they were directly, almost word for word, quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy. So, so God was able to instruct me if I was open to be instructed. And so we never have to fear. Um, if God was teaching us error in regarding to November 9th and July 18th, what does that say about us? Right? Because what do people do when they decide that what they believed was error? Do they question themselves or do they question the people that supposedly gave them the error? You question everybody else, usually. So they're never to blame 
But you know, you know the saying, it takes two to lie, one to lie and one to listen. Right? So if you've bought into a lie, it says just as much about you as it does about the liar. Correct? Yeah. Okay. So, so we need to know whether we're willing to follow God or not, wherever he's leading. Okay. Um, now, Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. What is righteousness in that verse then? Congregation, a gift. Is it? Congregation, yes, sir. Their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. It is a gift of righteousness. How does it come to us then? Congregation, it is a gift. Now put those two things together. Their righteousness is of me. It is a gift. He who receives it, what does he receive? Congregation, a gift. He who receives it as a gift that it is, receives what? Congregation, righteousness. According to what? God's idea of righteousness. Will he give us anything than that which is righteousness in his own sight and according to his own mind? Congregation, no. Do you see that point? Then he who does not receive the righteousness of God as the free gift of God, does he have it? congregation no and he cannot so have it you see because it is a gift it is of god it comes from god by the precious gift that it is and therefore it being of god and he giving it of his own gift it is left to me to get it in his own way he gives what is his own and he gives it according to his own idea that is the genuine article that is the righteousness of god alone then don't you see in that there can be no room in that there can be no room for a single thread of human invention. We cannot get it in there at all. Don't you see what ample provision the Lord has made that we may have the perfect robe, which he himself hath woven, which is the righteousness of God itself and which will make us complete now and in the time of the plagues and in every other time, and throughout all eternity. Brethren, I am glad that it is so. I am just as glad as I can be. A sister told me not long ago that before that time, four years ago, she had been lamenting her estate and wondering how in the world the time was ever going to come for the Lord to come if he had to wait for his people to get ready to meet him. For she said the way she had been at it, and she had worked as hard as anybody in this world, she thought, um, she saw that she was not making progress fast enough to bring the Lord in any kind of reasonable time at all. And she could not make out how the Lord was going to come. She was bothered about it, but she said when the folks came home from Minneapolis and they said, <clears throat> why the Lord's righteousness is a gift and we can have the righteousness of Christ as a gift, we can have it now. Oh, she said. Uh, that made me glad, that brought light, for then I could see how the Lord could come pretty soon when he himself gives us the garment, the clothing, the character that fits us for the judgment and for the time of trouble. I could then see how he could come just as soon as he wanted to. And, and said she, it made me glad, and I've been glad ever since. Brethren, I'm glad of it too, all the time. Now, I want to interject here a little bit. <clears throat> So we know that until Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, he will, not to come, he will not come to claim them as his own, right? So he has to wait for that to happen first. Now, now he says here, and she says, I guess, you know, that she sees that he could come any time just as soon as he wanted to. Is that true? If, if God, 
is it true that God can come as soon as he wants to? I know it's, it's, I'm asking the question for a reason. Well, in a sense it is, isn't it? Because he wants to save as many as possible. And if he chooses that it's not the right time to come yet because he wants to save many as possible, then that's his decision and he's not ready to come yet. But yeah. on the other hand, there's another sense where it may not be just when he wants to. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, it's kind of a trick question in a way, but... But we would say that God could come anytime that he wants to, right? But, but it, it needs to be qualified a little bit because in order for God to come, Christ's character does need to be reproduced in his people. But how does God have that happen? I mean, it doesn't just happen magically, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying by that? Yes. Right. So we, we go through these lines, these reform lines. There's these, this history of this world is all of these reform lines where God is taking man from when he fell and he's reforming him. And, and to some degree, it, it has been dependent upon man because man has to cooperate with God. But God in his foresight has seen what needs to occur in order for uh, humanity to be secure forever in in his kingdom right so so god knows the end from the beginning he knows how long it would take but but in a sense he has orchestrated it to some degree and we will see that as we look at his perfect plan as we study his plan of salvation uh, throughout eternity we will see how perfect that plan is how precise how needful it was i mean Jesus didn't come and die on the cross until 4,000 years after, you know, man had sinned. I mean, couldn't he have just come sooner? But God has to, all these things that happen to happen at four time for our learning upon whom the end of the world has come. So God has a purpose and a plan. It unfolds under God's providence. Chris, you have a comment? Oh, well, I was just going to say you know, I believe the Bible, and I'm not, I'm not quoting this quite right, but at the full in the fullness of time, he sent his son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, right? So it, it's it has to be in the fullness of time. So there is a there is a time that God has set, and and we don't know when that is for all things to close up. Now, as far as the idea of about saving as many as he could, I mean. I mean, we could argue, well, God should just let everything go on forever and ever until, you know, finally, you know, more and more people are going to be saved. But we see that the world is getting more wicked. And so it's not just that Christ's character is being rep reproduced in his people, but also Satan's character is being developed, right? Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of this world that he has in uh, as a counter claim to Christ. Um, kingship satan has built up his kingdom and just like noah's flood there comes a point where mercy can no longer plead with humanity only eight people were saved in noah's ark and so so we have as truth and light unfold as the gospel unfolds the world also becomes more and more unsavable in a sense. That there would be, I, I don't know if you could take the law of diminishing returns, uh, but there comes a point, if you use the law of diminishing returns, at some point, you actually have no return. I don't know if people know what the law of diminishing returns is. It's an economic term. But you know, if you you know, grow a business a certain size, for instance, that business is going to make a certain profit. You could keep try building it bigger and bigger, but your profit isn't going to change, right? So those are types of examples of it. So, so there comes a point where history has to end. 
not just because Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, but the light of the glory of, of God has been finally revealed to humanity. And, and it has to be revealed. I mean, God couldn't withhold that, you know, to, to let the world go on and on so more people could be saved. He has been revealing his glory to save humanity. It's not something he can withhold. He gives as much as can be born, as much as we can bear, I guess, of, of his righteousness. And so inevitably, history comes to uh, an end. Do people agree with that idea there? So. It sounds like process he would use. Mm -hmm. Because it, everything that God does is the result, the outworking of his character of love. So everything is done in love. So God is, is constrained by love. You know, sometimes we talk about God's all powerful, right? He's, he's omnipotent. But God, is there things God cannot do? He will not force obedience. Can God lie? It's impossible for him to lie, Paul says. Never. Right? So, so there are things that God cannot do because of his character. I mean, he has all power, but he will not act contrary to love. And his love and mercy isn't something we fully understand. But everything that God has done is the result of his love because of his character because god is love right so everything he does is love okay <clears throat> um he says now there is a sense in that thing today you know we have all been in the same place you know the time was when we actually sat down and cried because we could not do well enough to satisfy our own estimate of great doing and as we were expecting the Lord to come soon, we dreaded the news that it was so near for how in the world were we going to be ready? Thank the Lord. He can get us ready. Congregation. Amen. He provides the wedding garment. The master of the wedding feast always provided the wedding garment. He is the master of the wedding supper now, and he is going to come pretty soon. And he says, here's the clothing that will fit you to stand in that place. Now, there will be some folks that cannot attend that feast because they have not on the wedding garment. But the Lord offers it as a free gift to all and as to the man who does not take it, who is to blame. Another thing, do not believe, do you believe now? And let us have that settled before we go any further. I want to know how many people in this house actually believe, write down honestly in their hearts, that God is able to say what he means when he says it. And then when you and I read what he says, just as he says it in the Bible, I want to know whether it is any use for you and me to go over to some other part of the Bible and hunt up some other text to see whether that does not contradict this. Is the Lord able to tell his own story in his own way without contradicting himself? Congregation, yes. We have been at that long enough. So I do not propose to harmonize any texts of the scripture and all the work that I shall have to do here in this institute. I think the Lord is everything straight, exactly as it is. I do not think he needs any of my help. I think rather that I need his help to see that there is no contradiction at all. And I think that if there appears to me to be a contradiction, then I need more of his spirit to see that there is none, right? And this is one of the ways that I approached chronology. So, I saw so many people on the internet who in approaching chronology, when something contradicted, the problem wasn't with their ideas. The problem was with the Bible or whatever information they were looking at. But I took the position that the Bible does not contradict itself. And that what I needed to do in studying is to find out what the Bible says, even if it doesn't go along with my ideas. 
And so I accepted whatever the Bible said about biblical chronology. Some of them, the, some of these things the Bible said were hard for me to accept. But I did accept them in the end, right? So, and, and I think that if there appears to me to be a contradiction, then I need more of his spirit to see that there is none. And so that is the problem. We need to see that if, if I find a problem with the Bible, then I need his spirit. The problem isn't with the Bible. And instead of trying to harmonize the supposed contradiction, I'm going to say that the Lord knows all about that. And I'm going to wait until he gives me breath of mind, breadth of mind, enough to see it is no contradiction there at all. So what I want here to decide now and forever is that um, um, is that when you read anything in the Bible, that means exactly what it says, and you need not hunt. Okay, we read that. Uh, no, I guess he's just repeating himself. Hunt up anything in the Bible to see whether that tells the other side of it. There's no other side. It is all one. Well, then, how are you going to explain everything in the Bible when people ask you? There is the difficulty. Men go out preaching the gospel, and they think if they cannot explain everything that people ask them, it is going to be a great discredit to their ministry. No, sir, it will be well for you to acknowledge that there are some things, even in the Bible, that you have not grasped fully yet. This is a really important point because uh, it's not even so much when you go to preach to people. When somebody brings up a contradiction, maybe it's a question, maybe it is in contact with others that, you know, we find that there's something we haven't thought of before and, and it's brought to our attention. And what do we do about it? Well, we usually figure up an answer out of our own mind, even though we don't know anything, right? We come up with some solution to that problem. And what's the problem with that? You mean a solution that we come up with or something? Or? Yeah, so if somebody comes up with, let's say, uh, here's an example. Uh, the law in Galatians, you know, the law is done away. So what do Seventh-day Adventists do? Well, the law in Galatians, oh, that's the ceremonial law, right? That's man's idea to solve a problem, right? Because you're in a debate, you're in a discussion, somebody brings up an objection, and so you have to come with an answer to that objection right away. I mean, I remember early in my Adventist years, that's the way it was. I was trying to defend the truth, but I didn't understand enough to do so. It would have been much better just to say, I don't know. That's a really good question. Let's pray about it. Let's find out what God's word says. Right? But, but often when we come up with our own solutions, we create actually more problems and contradictions. And that's how a lot of religions end up developing. Because somebody came up with an objection to something somebody believed. A person came up with what he thought was a solution to that problem. And um, that becomes almost their whole doctrine sometimes. So... <clears throat> what the Lord asks of you and me is stated in 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, and it is the key of all Bible study. It is God's directions for Bible study. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give the understanding in all things. The only thing he asks of you and me is to consider what he says. And if we have to consider it for 10, 15, or 20 years to find out what it means, we will find that it was worth 20 years of waiting. We need not be disappointed at all. Bear in mind that the longer you have to consider a text to find out what is in it, the more it will be worth when you get it. So there is no place for discouragement ever. Therefore, if I cannot measure the depths of it, 
I am going to be glad that it is so deep, that when I do get it, I shall rejoice as long as I live. Now we have to do, all we have to do in these lessons is to consider what he says and depend upon him to give us the understanding of it. Um, that is all. That is all I can do. And everyone that will do that will get more out of it than the one who does not consider what he says. Then their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. That is what he says, congregation, yes. It is a gift of righteousness. It is a gift. Is that so, congregation? Yes. Now, how do we receive a gift? The righteousness is of me. He gives it a free gift. How do we get it, congregation? By faith. By faith. By faith. Let us bear in mind also the definition, which we have studied, of what faith is. Not a satanic belief. That is not faith at all but a submission of the will to God, a yielding of the heart to him, the affections fixed upon him, there is faith. That is God's idea of faith. And when we read of faith and get his word of belief, which he has spoken in his word, that is what he means. Mark this. It is received by faith. It is known by faith. But let us read the text and see that it is so. Romans 1, verse 17. The 16th verse is talking about the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Um, what alone can obtain it then, congregation? Faith. Not faith to works, but from faith to faith. But what is faith? Submission of the will to him, yielding the heart to him, the affections fixed upon him, that is, surrender of self and takes what God says as the fact. In other words, faith is simply this, that when God says a thing and you and I read it, we say, that is so, that is faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. What is the source of faith then? Congregation, the word of God. And how does faith come to us, congregation? By hearing the word of God. Faith comes to us by the word of God. That is the source, the fountain of faith. Then when the word is read, you yield to that and say, that is so. I take that, it, at, take that as it says, with no attempt to explain it, even to myself. I take it as God says it. I receive it just as he says it. I rest upon it just as he says it. He giving me understanding of it, then I want to know whether I do not receive the word and from it just what he has in it to give to me. Then I want to know whether I do not receive the word. Okay. Uh, assuredly, that also precludes our getting any thread of human invention into it. So we want to examine our hearts. Uh, then it is of faith. It comes by faith. So you can see the difference here. The faith is the faith in God, not the faith and trust in ourselves, not the faith and trust in our own understanding of what God says, but our faith in God, implicit and explicit faith, trusting in him in spite of what we see, in spite of what we feel, in spite of what we know, we trust that God is working in us, that he's accomplishing a work in us. So he says, then it is of faith. It comes by faith. We receive it in that way. Then don't you see that with the man who does not understand and begins to question righteousness by faith alone, the trouble is that his soul is not submitted to God. His heart is not yielded to God. The affections are not fixed upon him. That is the difficulty. All the trouble that ever comes to anybody in this world over justification by faith is in the heart in the refusal to submit to God. And that is the carnal mind. As we read the other night, the carnal mind cannot comprehend it, does not know it. And you see the problem here in righteousness by faith that happened in 1888, and that still happens today, is that people are unconverted and unwilling to be converted. And so their understanding of righteousness by faith, it's not an intellectual problem, it's a spiritual problem. If we're, if we're not willing to submit to God's righteousness, 
if we're not willing to give up our own reasoning and understanding, then we're going to use our reasoning and understanding to avoid the truth. And we know that we can't understand without God. We can't comprehend without God enabling us to comprehend. And that comes from us choosing to follow God. Now let us turn to the third chapter of Romans and begin reading with the 20th verse. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Justified is made righteous. So whenever we read it here, you can just put the words made righteous there instead. And you have the same thing always. For by the law of the, is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. And then do their best congregation. No, sir, for there is no difference unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, the verse I am after being justified, made righteous. How congregation freely being made righteous freely. Is it so, congregation? Yes. Is it so, congregation? Amen. Let us thank the Lord that it is so. Let us take it right now, congregation. Amen. Being made righteous freely by his grace. Now, let us stop here with that word grace and turn over to Romans 11, verse 6, where we read as follows. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And when grace is no more grace, what in the world then are the people in this world going to do? When the grace of God is gone, what are we going to do? Voice, we would be gone too. Yes, brethren, let us submit. Let us submit. But if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. A man's works is all gone if there are no more works. Don't you see then what becomes of a man who takes that course? Now, Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. Whose righteousness? Congregation God's. God has sent forth who to declare it? Congregation Christ. Yes for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time. When is that? Congregation, now. Is that right now, just now, tonight? Congregation, yes. Just now, four minutes of nine o'clock? Congregation, yes. His righteousness? Congregation, yes. To you? Congregation, yes. Thank the Lord for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, will you go out of this house realizing that? I want to ask, if any man goes out of this house without that, what in the world is the matter? Voice, unbelief. Who is to blame? Voice, the man himself. Then let us not do it. The Lord wants us to receive the latter rain. And shall we ask for it? And then when it comes, not take it as his, he gives it? because it does not come quite as we thought it would come? It is none of your business how it comes. It is for him to give it and for us to have discernment, to see that it is he who gives it. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, that he might be righteous. Oh, he is all right then. It is not going to tangle him. It is not going to disgrace him, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And when God justifies, I want to know what business in the world anybody has to condemn. He does it. He is able to do it. He has fixed the thing so he can do it and be just all the time. Be just in the doing of it. Well, then, let us be 
Let us let him have his own way. The law of God is satisfied. Let us be delighted, congregation, amen. I can tell you when I found out that in the doing of this, the Lord was justified and that the law of God was satisfied, I was delighted. Now we will read right on. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified, made righteous by faith without the deeds of the law. Is that a right conclusion? Congregation, yes. Now, is it? Congregation, yes. Who drew it? Whose conclusion is it? Congregation, uh, yes. Whose conclusion is it? I think that must be a typo anyway. Congregation, God's. Okay, let us have... Let us let him have his own way. Is not he able to argue straight? What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. What good is a man glorying then if he cannot glory before God? We want something to glory in. When the heavens split open and the face of God shines into the hearts of men, we want something that we can glory in just then. I tell you, God gives us something that we can do it with too. And that is his own righteousness. For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What does that say? Abraham believed God and it, it, I-T. What? Congregation, faith. In what? Congregation believed God. His believing God did, did that amount to, what did that amount to? Congregation righteousness. Who counted it to him for righteous, righteousness? Congregation God. Well, did God make a mistake? Congregation, no. Whether we understand it or not, the Lord did it. And he did right in doing it. He was perfectly just. He said so. And we were not in the doing of it. We did not have the plan to lay. We could not have done it if we had tried anyway. Let us let him have his own way, I say again, brethren. And when we let him have his own way and we are in his own way, it will be all right and we need not be a bit afraid. So just to unpackage this a little bit, because um, Jones is doing a good job, you know, what he's saying is, I think, fairly clear. Um, but if we think about the plan of salvation, the idea that God is just, both just and a justifier of them that believeth in Jesus, this goes counter to Satan's claims, correct? Because what is say, Satan saying about God? When a third of the angels fell from heaven, even before that, what was Satan saying about God? Satan say, said that he was righteous. Satan yeah. claimed he was righteous. Yeah. So, so Satan didn't believe God was righteous. God was being unjust, right? Yeah, right. He was unjust. Un demands upon the angels that was really a restriction of our freedom, that we the angels weren't really free. And of course, they were free. They, they could disobey. They had a choice. So, but God could not change the requirements of his kingdom because his righteousness could not allow unrighteousness to exist. Because unrighteousness would destroy God's kingdom. But he still allowed it to exist. But then God has to be both just and also be able to justify the, the wicked. So, so Satan's cast out of heaven, but now God creates Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve sin. But God is now going to redeem them. Is that just in Satan's eyes? Does Satan see 
the redemption of man is something that's just? I would say probably not. No. Because he was, it, you know, it's like the spoiled kid, you know, who uh, gets punished and um, doesn't feel it's just that somebody else who did something bad as well isn't punished just the same as him, right? Or, you know, we should, you know, the kid who gets, uh, you know, is disobedient um, and doesn't understand why somebody else is is not treated as badly as him for his disobedience or whatever. You know, you get the idea there that we have this idea of justice, but our idea of justice is not just, is it? You know, a good example from the Bible would be those, those workers who got all the same amount of pay, no matter how much they worked, how long, how much of the burden of the day that they they labored. They all got the same payment because they all agreed to it. Was God just in doing that? Yeah. They all agreed to it. Yeah. And of course, that gift is eternal life. So, you know, so some people could argue, well, the person who, uh, you know, had to go through much greater trial um, to gain eternal life or whatever you want to say, however you want to put it, um, you know, why is this other person here? Obviously, you know, it's, it's an incomplete illustration in some ways, but you get the point of the idea that God is just in how he has meted out salvation and that's the whole issue of the great controversy is it not isn't what that that what the thousand years is for us to understand to see that god was just now we know he's just by faith but we have to see it and also those who have had judgment pronounced upon them will they not also see that god is just will satan himself acknowledge that god is just in the end. Mm. And, and isn't that just? Imagine if our court systems were such that we could reveal the sin to the sinner to the point where they would actually acknowledge the decision of the court and that that was a requirement of the court that you were able to not just convince a jury but can but convince the person who has committed the sin, the crime. But that's what God does. He's so just that even those who receive this just sentence will in the end admit that it is just. Every shall bow and every tongue confess. It's pretty amazing. It is. That, that's that's the whole issue of the great controversy for me when I saw that, when I saw that in reading the book, The Great Controversy, because that's really where I first saw it clearly and, and have continued to understand it, that God is just. And I understand it in the sense that it comes from his love. I can see, you know, as a parent, um, the mercy and love that God has for us, how a parent can... Uh, forbear and yet plead and work for the salvation of their children and that God is doing that for us and you know often parents will punish a child even when the child doesn't fully understand it and often a parent can punish a child unjustly which can leave sort of a, a bitter wound in a child but God isn't going to do that. Everything that he does will be seen as just because God is just. And yet he's going to justify the wicked, make the wicked righteous. That is the wicked people who were sinners will become righteous. And that can seem on the surface to those who aren't filled with God's spirit as unjust. But in the end, it will be seen as just even by those who reject God's righteousness. <clears throat> um, 
what was Abraham counted? What was counted to Abraham for righteousness? He believed God, and God said, "You are righteous, Abraham." Now, that is said three times in that little short space. What was it that was counted to him for righteousness? His believing God. It. 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 Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, is that what it says? Congregation, yes. Did the Lord say it that way? Congregation, yes. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. But that is the Laodicean message again. Miserable and poor and blind and naked. That is the kind of people that the Lord justifies. His faith is counted to him for righteousness. The ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What is counted to him? Congregation, his faith for righteousness. And that is believing that God is justifying ungodly men. Will that bring righteousness to a man? Congregation, yes. To confess that he is ungodly and then believe that God makes that kind of man righteous. Yes, indeed. I cannot tell how. I cannot understand it. I know it is so, and I'm glad that it is so, that I do not care whether I ever find out how or not. The Lord wants us to have what he gives. Let us take it. The time has expired, and we will begin right there again, but do not forget what was counted to Abraham for righteousness. And if we believe, if we be Christ's, then we are Abraham's seed. So, I mean, that's a pretty powerful message that Jones presents there in the 1893 at the General Conference at the Institute. I don't know how, I don't know how people reject that. You know. Well, well, the way that they reject it. Yeah. Okay. Well, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. Well, the way that people are rejected is, is they know that we need to be righteous, right? Um, right. And, and so what they want to see is they want to see righteousness. They believe they need to see themselves as righteous in order to be righteous. But if you see yourself as righteous, what are you? Self-righteous. <laughs> so I feel like. No. God, it, it matters that God sees me as righteous. And, and God's only going to see me as righteous if I allow him to give me his righteousness, right? Because can God right. see me? So God can't see me as righteous if I'm trusting in my own righteousness. If I'm trusting in my filthy rags, can God see me as righteous? No, no, because he sees it as filthy rags. Because God, God understands reality. He doesn't live in a fantasy world. You know, and I've seen this time and time again in Adventism, that God just covers us with the garment of his righteousness. And, and one even, one preacher said, you know, that he puts it over our filthy rags. But we know the Bible says that he has to remove the filthy rags, right? If we have any of our righteousness, if we're claiming any righteousness of our own, God can't cover over our unrighteousness. We have to see that we are unrighteous and then ask God to remove that unrighteousness and clothe us with a change of raiment. And then we're not going to see ourselves as, as, as righteous, are we? Right? Because, right? because if we were to see ourselves as righteous, what would we need to have in order to see ourselves as righteous? Wouldn't we need, wouldn't we need a knowledge that we don't have? You understand what I'm saying here? Because righteousness is in God, right? So our responsibility is, is to see ourselves as unrighteous, to recognize our unlikeness to Christ because righteousness does not come from us. It comes from God. So it's yeah. like the alcoholic. Does the alcoholic who goes to AA ever consider himself not to be an alcoholic anymore? Yeah. 
No, he considers himself an alcoholic. Yeah, I have a friend here in the building who comes to the studies. He's been dry now for 38 years. He still goes to AA and he still professes to be an alcoholic. But he hasn't drunk a drop of alcohol for 38 years. But he's still an alcoholic. Does a person who has received Christ, Christ's righteousness claim to be righteous? Does do they see themselves as righteous? It can't possibly be. And so if we look at ourselves and we say, well, I'm okay, you know, I'm better than the other guy is. I've improved a lot. Um, I don't really see any problems with myself. Do we believe God? Because remember, when God says about us that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, do we believe him? And if we do, then we will be able to see um, our situation. Okay. Any other thoughts? So I'm not going to go and start reading number 16. Um, because this would take a little bit of while to, to get into what he's saying, because he's going to be building up some things, um, dealing with the latter rain. Um, but hopefully we can see this much more clearly. We can see that we're sinners. We're going to trust in Christ's righteousness. But this does not mean that, um, you know, we know that, that, that faith without works is dead. There's the comment there in uh, what about faith without works is a dead faith, right? So in addressing that, we can see that there will be works, but that's not what we focus on, is it? Are we going to wait to see works in ourselves before we believe that, that Christ can make us righteous? Haven't we heard many times the argument against righteousness by faith is that we're still sinners and that other people we see are still sinners. So people say, well, we can't possibly obey God and be righteous, right? Haven't we heard that? Yeah. yeah. The most common argument I hear from Seventh-day Adventists, how can you say that we can overcome sin? Nobody's overcome sin, only Christ. So we just need to be satisfied that we're, we're always going to be sinning until Jesus comes back. And that's not the counter. Now, it's true that we will, will not see ourselves as righteous, but God isn't going to come and take us to be with him unless we want to be in heaven. And, we, and if we want to be in heaven, then we have to want to be in heaven now. And that means to be, have Christ's character. Because if we don't have Christ's character, he can't bring us into heaven. We wouldn't want to be there. Now, it's also a bit of equivocation, too, because when they talk about perfection, uh, they actually hold up a different standard of perfection uh, than what's revealed in the Bible. Because what is perfection in the Bible? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Did Christ, as a human being, was he perfect in, in, in the sense of ultimate absolute perfection? Did he ever make a mistake? Can, can you have creature perfection? Creature. So creature oh. perfection. Yeah, so creature perfection would be be the idea of you know not being able to make a mistake so if we make mistakes as human beings did christ make mistakes that is do you think it's possible that christ in uh, building his first bit of furniture that it, he did a perfect job that it was perfect how would you even define
right? So when God's talking about perfection, he's not talking about ultimate uh, physical perfection. He's talking about the character, right? The thoughts and intents of the heart. Isn't that what perfection is about? Perfection of character? We've never argued for creature perfection, but that's what they hold up as perfection. You know, if you're hammering nails and you're a carpenter and you hit your thumb with a hammer, have you made a mistake? Yep. Okay. Does that have anything to do with your character? I mean, maybe if you were careless, but I mean, it's your thumb. Um, yeah, I think it has to do with your character. Yeah. I mean, you definitely aren't wanting to hit your thumb with a hammer. Your response may tell you something about your character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I guess these are you yeah. got people who've had uh, responses or seen responses by people who've hit their hand. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think your response will say something about your character. But, but you see the point is that this equivocation that's substituting one meaning of a word for another. And, and that it's sort of a, a bait and switch type of thing. So you, I mean, Christ was perfect in character, but he wasn't, a, he didn't have creature perfection. He still had the lim limitations of humanity, but his character was perfect. He never by a thought yielded to temptation. And so when people hold up this idea where Ellen White says we still may make mistakes and that these mistakes will actually bring us to the foot of the cross. It doesn't mean we don't have a perfection of character. No, we may not see ourselves, we see ourselves as sinners, but we can have that perfect character in Christ. He will work out his righteousness in us if we allow him to. If we, it doesn't mean that we don't seek to be perfect in our character, that we, somehow just say, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to allow these sins to continue because I can never be perfect. If we do that, we can. That'd, be, a, that'd be another extreme. <laughs> so these are extreme. Be, yeah. The other extreme. Yeah. Yeah. So, but people will do these types of arguments. So we know that, uh, that faith worketh by love that purifies the soul. That we will have a perfect character. And we will do the works. Now, it's interesting too, just sort of as an aside. Are the, are the righteous judged by works? It's a simple question. In the Bible, does it ever say that the righteous are judged by their works? Are there motives? Well, the righteous are judged, that is, they're judged by their faith, right? Now, yeah. no, faith that works is dead. But aren't the wicked always judged by their works and by their words? So the wicked are judged by their works, but the righteous aren't. Does that make sense? But are the righteous perfect in character? But even anybody, even any righteous man, if we were to be judged by our works, uh, couldn't we, we look back at our past and see that we've sinned? Well, the right character produces works, right works. Right. So, so. You know. You know, let's say I, I become perfect one day, character, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm sealed. I'm part of the 144,000. Let's imagine that. And now, sure, my sins have gone beforehand to judgment and been blotted out. But did I sin in the past? Yes. And so if I was to be judged by my works, wouldn't my works condemn me? Yeah, if you're just right. right. Just so that, yeah. the reason why the wicked are judged by their works is because they, they don't have faith 
their works are going to stand on their account. Their sins have not gone beforehand to judgment and been blotted out. That's all they have left is the works. That's all but they got in works. So they'll be judged by their works. But the righteous, they're justified by faith. They're not justified by works. Because if you look at their works, because you have to take your whole life, you can't just say, well, you know, I sinned for 99% of my life, but for the last week I've been righteous. So, um, you know, if I die, then somehow my sins in the past won't count. You know, of course. How good is good enough? What percentage? <laughs> you know. Exactly. So, so we know that our past still exists. We're still sinners. An alcoholic is still an alcoholic, even if he's been dry for 38 years. He knows he has, has this past. He knows his nature. So the righteous, they're not trusting in their works. They're trusting in what Christ is doing in them and has done for them. Not exactly in that order. So anyway, uh, let's close with prayer. It's a marvelous thing. Okay. Yeah. And, and one thing, well, I'll put this on this recording is um, if you've gotten the email about the meetings, on Sunday we're moving from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So we're moving an hour later than last week. Um, reason has to do with my schedule. Um, and I'm also going to try to make uh, Sunday's presentation at 3 o'clock on uh, the lines. Um, I haven't really kept up my end of the bargain there is making them a simple presentation of the line. So I'm going to try to simplify it a bit more, uh, end up getting a little bit too deep, but um, uh, so we're going to try to make that simpler. And then of course, Dwight is presenting tomorrow morning at uh, uh, the usual time there that we do, which is 7.30 Mountain Standard Time. Um, so remember the meetings. And then of course we have uh, the Canadian group uh, this week, and it's going to be um, James Filipchek uh, presenting. So, um, and if somebody doesn't know who's watching these videos, doesn't know the uh, uh, Canadian groups uh, thing, you can always email me if you want to know the, the Zoom connection. But I do put it on WhatsApp and everything. I'm pretty sure most people would know, but somebody might be watching this video who wants to. Uh, and you can always email me, Theodore James Turner at gmail.com. Anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time that we have had here this evening on your Sabbath hours. And we just pray, Lord, that you can continue to teach us. Uh, thank you for each person. And help us, Lord, to learn of you. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.